If you have any information relating to the identities of the decedents in this video, please contact Sumter County Sheriff's Office on the telephone at 803-436-2790. You can also contact Sumter County Coroner's Office on the telephone at 803-436-2111. On the 9th of August, 1976, at approximately 6.20am, a trucker on his way to work driving along Locklear Road in Sumter County, South Carolina, came across the lifeless bodies of a male and a female, both lying face up on their backs at the side of the road. The trucker, upon discovering their bodies, first contacted an employee at a nearby stall. The employee was the one who then contacted the authorities. When police arrived, it became clear to them that they were dealing with a homicide. Both the male and the female victim were found to have been shot three times each, both receiving one shot in the back, one shot in the chest, and one shot in the throat, with a 357 caliber revolver. The investigators thought that both victims had first been shot elsewhere, perhaps in a vehicle, and they were then dumped on the side of the road where they were found, and shot again. The male victim was white, with an olive complexion, and originally thought to be between 18 and 22 years old, though the dental examiner determined that he was at least 27 years old, so his age range was increased to 18 to 30 years old. Standing at about 6 feet, or 6 feet 1 inch tall, weighing 150 to 160 pounds, Described as having an athletic build, with brown shoulder-length hair, brown eyes, bushy eyebrows, extensive and very expensive dental work which may have been performed outside the United States, him possibly being halfway through a complete dental restoration, having had a very unique fluted root canal surgery, which only a select few dentists in the US at the time were skilled enough to perform, an acrylic or porcelain crown on his left front tooth, fillings in most of his front teeth, missing wisdom teeth on the bottom of his mouth in the back, several missing teeth at both the top and the bottom of his mouth but especially in the top back left, also having a four inch scar from an appendectomy, two two inch scars on the back of his right shoulder which are characteristics of players of certain contact sports, and he did not smoke. He was found wearing a red t-shirt that read Cause America's Light Beer on the front and Camel Challenger GT Sebring 75 on the back along with a Snoopy design. Faded Levi brand jeans, a gold Belova Accutron brand wristwatch with a twist o flex band bearing the serial number H918803 and a 14 karat gold ring set with a grey star sapphire stone which had the initials JPF engraved inside of it with a Florentine finish. He was wearing no underwear. The shirt he wore was a promotional item, which could only be bought from one of the Sebring races held in Sebring, Florida in 1975, which was sponsored by the Coors Brewing Company. Using the serial number on his watch, investigators were able to determine that the Belova Company had made the watch in 1968 and one investigator in particular believed that the watch was bought the same year it was made. When the company downsized in the early 1970s, they destroyed many of the records, meaning that there was no way to determine where the victim's watch was distributed or bought. Both his ring and his watch were said to be very expensive items. He was carrying no money, but did have a packet of Grant's Truck Stop brand matches in one of his pant pockets, which could have only been purchased in either Idaho, New Mexico, or Nebraska. The female victim was also white with an olive complexion, and was originally thought to be between 18 and 20 years old, though in 2015 her age estimate was officially increased to anywhere between 18 and 25 years old, standing at about 5 feet 5 inches tall, weighing between 100 and 110 pounds, described as having a slim build, with reddish-brown shoulder-length hair, blue, grey, green or hazel eyes, two distinctive moles on the left side of her face near her mouth, a mole on the right side of her face, 
a mole on the back of her right calf, fillings in all of her back teeth, missing upper and lower wisdom teeth on the right side of her mouth, unshaven legs, long natural eyelashes, no surgical scars, she had never been pregnant, was not wearing any makeup, and she did not smoke. She was found wearing an unbleached white muslin blouse over a pink front tying halter shirt, blue denim cut off shorts, a floral print scarf tied around her waist as a belt, lavender and hot pink coloured stride rights brand wedge heeled sandals, a ring in the shape of a black oblong stone with small turquoise chips embedded in it, a ring in an ornate scrolling feather shape with coral and turquoise stones and a metal band ring with red, white, and blue coloured stones. Like her male companion, she too was wearing no underwear and was not carrying any money. All the rings she wore appeared to be authentic handmade Native American or Mexican costume jewellery and were all made of sterling silver. Her rings are thought to have originated in the southwestern United States. Both victims had no drugs or alcohol in their systems when they died. They were said to have been clean and well kept, and neither were sexually assaulted. In the early hours of the morning on the 9th of August, the day the two victims were found, a couple matching their descriptions were seen getting out of a car on Locklear Road. The pair are thought to have died somewhere between 12am and 1am on the 9th, as gunshots and a speeding car were heard by residents of the area around that time. The autopsy revealed that both victims had eaten either fruit or fruit ice cream shortly before they died, and so investigators were certain that the two must have bought the food from a local food stall or store. An employee of a fruit stall located off the Florence Highway remembered seeing a couple matching the victims' descriptions, but could not remember if they were with anyone else or if they had a car. Once news of the pair's death circulated, a Nebraska car repairman came forward to say that he had performed repairs on a car owned by a couple who looked similar to the unidentified pair. He claimed that the car had either a Washington or an Oregon State license plate. A few days after the pair's deaths, investigators met with a mother and father in Brunswick, Georgia, who thought that the female victim may be their missing daughter. Their daughter's ex-boyfriend reported a similarity between the female victim and his ex-girlfriend. However, after showing the parents of the missing woman photographs of the female victim, neither they nor her friends could verify that she was the missing woman. After a dental comparison was made, it was discovered that the two women were not a match. When no one else came forward to identify the two victims, their bodies were put on display at a local funeral home in caskets with airtight see-through lids in hopes that someone would recognise them. People all over the United States came to view the bodies, but no one was able to put a name to their faces. That is, until months later, when police received a tip from a man who believed he may have met the two victims at a KOA campgrounds in Santee, South Carolina, where he worked. The KOA employee said that he believed the male victim was a man he made friends with at the campgrounds, who went by the name Jock, as in J-O-C-K, or, more likely, Jock, as in J-A-C-Q-U-E-S. While playing pool, Jacques told the KOA employee that he was the son of a prominent doctor in Canada who had practically disowned him because he refused to pursue a career in medicine. Jacques said that he was taking a vacation of sorts with his girlfriend, travelling the country aimlessly. The KOA employee could not remember Jacques's girlfriend's name. Jacques said that he had formerly been a teacher. The employee also stated that Jacques was wearing a ring that looked a lot like the one found on the unidentified male. When the employee expressed interest in his ring, Jacques offered to sell it to him. The employee also told authorities that both Jacques and his girlfriend had suitcases with them, and Jacques was also carrying a sizable wad of cash. Jacques and his girlfriend stayed a few days at the campgrounds before leaving for Florida. They stopped at the campgrounds again a few days later on their way back from Florida, again having suitcases in their possession. The couple said that they liked the campground better than Florida. The initials JPF carved inside the unidentified man's ring corroborated the theory that Jacques was the unidentified man.
KOA did keep records of all who stayed at their campgrounds at the time, however, law enforcement decided not to pursue this lead any further, and all of KOA's records for that time period were later destroyed in a fire. A forensic dentist in Spartanburg charted the unidentified man's mouth, and the American Dental Association published his findings, hoping a dentist somewhere would come forward and recognise the extensive and unique work done. No dentist ever came forward to say they had done work on his teeth. Contact was made with several agencies in Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, and in the Mediterranean, but still the pair could not be identified. In January 1977, a man was arrested for driving under the influence in Letter, South Carolina, little over an hour from where the victim's bodies were found. In the man's vehicle, a revolver was found which authorities noted was of the same kind as the murder weapon with which the two unidentified victims were killed. After being test-fired, it was proven to have been the exact same murder weapon that killed the unidentified couple. The man admitted to being in possession of the gun for several years, including when the unidentified couple were killed. He did, however, have an alibi. He said that at the time of the unidentified couple's murders, he was visiting his wife in hospital about two hours away from where the couple were found. Witnesses did, in fact, see him at the hospital that day. Law enforcement calculated the distance between the hospital and the area in which the couple were found, and determined that it would not have been possible to have travelled such a distance in the time between when the man was last seen at the hospital and the time of the couple's murder. The man with the murder weapon's polygraph tests were inconclusive and police dropped the lead, the man never being charged with their murders due to insufficient evidence. Meanwhile, the unidentified couple's bodies remained on display at the funeral home, until they began to decay. On the 14th of August, 1977, one year and five days after the bodies were found, they were interred in Bethel United Methodist Church Cemetery in Oswego, South Carolina. Law enforcement agencies raised several hundred dollars to pay the funeral home, and hundreds of people attended their funeral service. Their graves are marked with Male Unknown, died August 9th, 1976, and Female Unknown, died August 9th, 1976, along with A Christian Burial Was Given by Bethel Church, August 14th, 1977. Years later, Serial killer Henry Lee Lucas later confessed to being in South Carolina on the day the unidentified couple were murdered. However, he wasn't charged with their murder, as he was notorious for false confessions, which he almost always later recanted. Because the two victims resembled one another, authorities initially thought that they may have been siblings. There are theories that the two victims may have been from French Canada or Argentina, and some think that the female victim may have been from the Middle East. It is possible that the pair fell victim to a carjacking. They may have been forced out of their car, killed, and their car stolen. In 2007, the victim's bodies were exhumed in order to gather DNA to submit into state, national, and international DNA databases. With this exhumation, it was found that the two were not biologically related at all disproving the theory that they had been siblings or close relatives. Still, the gathering of their DNA did not lead to an identification, as no matches were found in any of the databases. One notable theory put forth in recent years suggests that the pair may have been involved in drug trafficking. The way in which they were murdered is the way an execution is usually performed, among organised crime groups especially. This theory is supported by the fact that the male victim was wearing an INSA shirt from a 1975 Sebring, Florida race. During that time period, drug smuggling was running rampant within the ranks of INSA racing, and several prominent racers were convicted of drug smuggling. Some of these racers allegedly had connections to organised crime groups. The couple could have gotten involved in this industry if they were struggling for money which seems somewhat likely given that they were young and living a transient lifestyle. The two could have gotten involved with the wrong people, and then they were subsequently executed when they either caused trouble or brought attention to themselves. Though, of course, this theory has never been proven. In the 42 years since their deaths, we are left with nothing but theories to go on, 
as their true identities as well as the identity of their murderer or murderers remain a mystery it is believed that the pair were most likely living a transient lifestyle and travelling across the u s in the months leading up to their deaths according to the coroner who worked on this case until her retirement a lot of the evidence pertaining to this case has long since been misplaced lost or disposed of including the male victim's teeth authorities have decided to halt the investigation into the couple's deaths until they are identified over the years several missing people have been officially ruled out as being either of the unidentified couple please check the description for a list of each of the couple's rule outs if you have any information whatsoever about the circumstances surrounding this couple's deaths and all their identities check the beginning of the video again for correct agencies to contact